Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Orlando and today we're going to be talking about extending this Jay Morrison fiasco that's going on as far as, you know, a lot of investors haven't been paid and I just want to talk about everything that's going on. The SEC document came out that basically breaks down the investigation that they did on him and basically just explains and allows you to see into the books that Jay Morrison had and what's actually going on underneath the hood of his fund. And when I say there is just so much stuff to unpack, meaning it's so many wrong things that I see in this, it is just you know, we would be talking about this for two straight hours. That's how many red flags are in this document. It's incredible to me that you have this many red flags and there's just so much wrong with this fund. There's just no way for me to go over everything. Like I said, we'll be doing this for hours, but let's just go over the most bold, blatant things that I have seen in this document. I've read it from top to bottom just because that's what I love to do. I'm, I'm, I'm a numbers person. I love real estate, finance. If you go through my channel, you will see all that stuff. So for me, it's just very interesting to kind of see exactly how this all breaks down. Number one thing that I have seen in this entire thing is when you go into the documents, it talks about everything that I've said in my last video, there's no guarantees, all this other stuff, you can lose your money, basically you're donating the money and blah, 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 blah. That that portion to me doesn't really scare me off because, and it doesn't, it's not really a big deal to me because most funds will always tell you that there's a chance that you can lose everything and not get anything back. So that portion does not scare me. That portion does not like say, oh wow, you know, that's a red flag because most funds always say that there's a chance that you can lose everything. But, but when you read this document and the very first thing you see when it comes to, like I said, when it comes to managers and who the team is, I'm gonna put it right here above me. There is no mention about any team. It only states the background of Jay Morrison. The only thing that it says is it labels Jay Morrison as the manager. It does not label a team. It gives you his background. It tells you that he's filed bankruptcy in 2016. Now remember, he started collecting funds 2018-19, right? So, and probably sometime in 20, he was collecting it too. So you have a person who has filed bankruptcy. Remember this has filed bankruptcy, but yet is starting a fund to buy real estate, okay? Let that soak in. How can a person, let's just use common sense here. How can a person manage a fund but can't manage their own funds? Right? How does that make sense? I'm only reading directly from the report. I'm not making it up. I'm not ab-libbing here. I am literally reading it from the report. And I will put a link in the description to show you guys exactly what I'm talking about. You can read the report yourself, but I also will put the picture up of the screenshot of exactly what I'm talking about. You, you can't. That is rough. Anybody who is running a fund, look at this, guys. I just... If you go apply for a new job, they run your credit to make sure if you're going to work for a bank and you're going to be the CEO of a bank or you're going to be the director of U.S. Bank, Commerce, Bank of America, they're going to run your credit. If you have any delinquencies, bankruptcies, anything like that, you probably won't get the job. So wouldn't you expect that out of your fund manager too, to not have bankruptcies and delinquencies if he's going to be controlling your money? I would, I would. So that's just number one. Okay, so number two, the business that he is providing as far as taking in money and investing into real estate, he's doing multiple things. Not only is he investing in real estate, but he is also lending money on real estate. Now, I've been in this industry 
for 15 plus years and I can tell you lending money and investing money in real estate are completely two completely two different things. Most companies have two separate companies for that. But in this fund, you're doing two extremely hard things in one fund. You are trying to invest money to create interest so you can pay back your investors by investing in real estate. And then on top of that, you are also trying to lend money to also create interest so you can pay back investors. Those are extremely too hard things to do. Most companies can't even get away with that. But yet in this fund, he is doing both of those. So let's just kind of go over what the lending requirements are that he has in here. So he says that we will finance up to 85% of acquisition and construction. Now, is that high? Yes, that is high. Why is it high? Because if anything goes wrong, he only have 15% equity. Where's the buffer in that? 15% is minimum. Anyone in this industry would tell you that the minimum that you would probably bring in an investment situation where you're doing a construction loan is 20% minimum. Most of the time, it's 25%. So to do an 85% loan to value with investor money is extremely risky. Extremely risky because you don't have a buffer. If you just hit a bump in the road, you're at a loss. So that's one. And then it says, we intend to offer loans with terms with six months to three years. That's okay. I have no issue with that. We intend to provide interest only terms for loans with balloon payments at the end of each term. We will provide loan amounts from $10,000 to $5 million. $10,000? thousand dollars now he probably decided i'm gonna do a minimum of ten thousand dollars because i want to be diversified i want to make sure i have as many loans as possible to make sure that one loan doesn't sink me and that's understandable but the problem with that is is once again you don't have the manpower for that so not only do you have these little loans that you have to underwrite manage and and service, you have to service all of these loans unless you do a third party, but it doesn't say anything about a third party servicing. So my guess is, is that he's servicing the loans himself, which let's just talk about that for a small bit. A servicing department is huge. I mean, there are just companies just for servicing. So you have Jay Morrison, who is also servicing loans. He's also trying to underwrite loans. And then he's also trying to do investing in real estate also. So what I'm trying to say is you're doing all of this stuff and you're stretched completely too thin. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's impossible to keep up with, but it's so hard and I wouldn't want someone to take my money and for me to risk give me giving them money to hope that they can handle all of that underneath one roof with no help, with no list of publicly who's going to be helping him. That right there, ah, ah, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot, man. I'm telling you, it's just so many red flag so many things that you could just go man you I, I wish you guys could you know uh get your money back you know like it's so rough when you when you're reading documents like this and you've been in the industry and you know exactly what you're looking at and you know how it's normally done and you think to yourself like man this is just this is rough okay so number three I just want to go over these properties that he had for resale. And it just blows my mind when you go over the properties. And I love this stuff because I just see the numbers and I go, ah, good deal, bad deal. And so I just want to use this as an actual lesson. And when you look at these deals, kind of how to look at it, know if it's a good deal, bad deal, whatever. But let's just go over this real quick. So I'm reading this directly from the SEC document. It says, as of December 31st, 2019, we own two properties, one of which was held for resale, the other which is under development. These properties are located at 1000 Corette Road, um, Bridgewater, uh, New Jersey, and 3015 Martin Street, Atlanta, Georgia. Now it says, the investment 
located at 1000 Corret Road was acquired by a subsidiary, which is just an LLC, on December 27, 2018 for a purchase price of $355,000. Now remember that guys, $355,000. As of December 31st, 2019, this investment property was held for resale. This property is recorded at an acquisition cost of $364,000, $363 as of December 31st, 2018. In the year ending December 31st, 2019, an additional $76,857 was invested in this property for renovations and carrying costs. Now, my question is, you bought the property for acquisition costs of $364,000 basically, and then you added funds to it to fix up the property and for carrying costs of $76,000. Now, one would think that once you do that, once you put in money for the carrying cost, once you put in money to renovate the property, that you would then sell the property for profit. It is just really simple math. You add up what you purchased it for, you add in the amount that you put in for carrying costs and renovation, and when you add that up, that is the amount that you should actually sell the property for. Well, this is amazing. As of March 27th, 2020, he sold the property. Now you have to remember, you have to remember, March 2020 is, we're still at the height of the market, right? Everything's looking good. And he sold the property for $426,000 for a grand loss of $55,918. A loss. He sold a property that he put money into for a loss. What is this? A couple of, uh, it looks like December... Four months later, four months later, he sold the property for a loss of $55,000 for a loss. How does that make sense at the height of the market? I would believe you would assume that the individual would does not know what they are doing. You would assume that. I would assume that if you take $76,000, four months before you sell the property and you put it into the property, you must believe that you're gonna sell it for more than what you totally invested into the property. But no, you sell the property three to four months later and you sell it for a loss. But the question is, why? Why would you sell it for a loss? Why would you care? What's the big deal for selling the property for a loss? Like. Is there an issue with selling it for a loss? Is there, you know, no one wants to lose money, right? Ah, but here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Okay, so number four, compensation. Compensation that the manager is going to receive for every transaction that he does and for managing the fund, period, right? When you look at this document, it's it's quite laughable. So you look at it and you go, okay, let's get to compensation. I will go ahead and put right above me here is the, the little snippet of what section I'm looking at here. Okay, so it says, underneath the operating agreement, we are required to pay the manager a monthly asset management fee calculated at 5.5%. Woo! It's just rich, rich, you know, rich, high percentage. Okay, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, you guys can read the rest of it. But the point that I really want to get to is the number, the dollar amount. But let's, before we get there, it says the manager reserves the right to defer collection of any compensation from the time that it is earned until sufficient cash is available without forfeiting any right to collect. Although the manager may earn interest, on any deferred compensation. So it doesn't matter if the fund is just, doesn't make anything, right? All the money is just gone. He runs it into the ground. He still collects a fee. He still will collect a fee no matter what. That's what that means. It does not matter 
what happens to the fund. It does not matter if it doesn't make any money. It does not matter if the fund explodes. It does not matter if the fund catches on fire. He makes his fee, period. That's what that means. So in December 31st, 2019, 2018, the total amount of management fee in incurred was $413,000 and some change and also $182,000 and some change respectively. As of December 31st, 2019 and 20 2018, the total management fee paid was $224,000 and some change and basically $400,000. Now, Let's go back to what I was talking about on number three. When I said I was talking about the properties. Now, when you have an individual who is not aligned, and I just want to really make this point home, when the individual isn't aligned to make sure that the fund makes money and they will make their money off of their fees. That is the reason why you can sell a property for a loss and not really care because you have already made your money. When you have made your money and you are making 400,000, 300,000 a year in fees, you don't have to care about making the, the fund profitable. You don't have to worry about selling a property for profit. You don't have to do any of that. And that is the reason why this is so important that you do research on individuals, that you look at individuals' character, that you decide and you think to yourself, what possibly could go wrong in this scenario? And is this individual true? Do they align with my values? Do they have a team? Are they reputable? Let me see testimonials. You have to be careful because when you read this document, you can obviously see that there are negatives, negatives, negative. There's parentheses over every number, which means it's a negative, which means it's at a loss. You are collecting millions and millions of dollars from people. You are investing in real estate, but yet everything is at a loss. Everything is at a loss. Everything is in parentheses. He just sold a property for negative $55,000, but yet he made a profit. It blows your mind just thinking about it. Like, if you can do that, who wouldn't love a job like that? I would love a job where I could just not care about what, what happens and still make a half a million dollars. But that's not even the best part portion of it. It's not, it's not, it's not there yet. Not there yet. Number five, man, these, these, <laughs> these financial statements, you look at them and you, <laughs> and I look at financial statements all day long. I would see a financial statement like this and I would say, sir, I'm sorry, there's no type of financing I can give you. Like you look at these finances, these financial statements, and I'm going to put them up in the right above me. And you look at this, right? So you have an individual who is collecting money for a fund, right? And they're investing into real estate. Well, in this whole of the financials, you look at it, the number that really stands out to me, really stands out to me is rental income. So you're investing millions and millions of dollars into real estate and you are expecting to pay back your investors. You're paying back your investors, right? Well, how do you pay back your investors on millions and millions of dollars when you your rental income is $3,000 for a whole year? 2019, you made $3,000 in rental income. Now, I'm not making these numbers up. I'm just pulling them straight off of this SEC document that was done by the government. And it shows that he only made $3,000 in rental income? How, how can you pay back in any investor with that? I mean, you know, to be honest, guys, if you if you were going to invest, you could make that yourself. If you invested, you know, just on a small, a single family home, you would make more money than that in a year. But in an entire fund, he's only making three thousand dollars and for an entire year. But it, it gets it gets it gets better than that, guys. But. He did make some money from some origination fees. He made about $35,000. Transaction uh, management fees, $47,000. But 
here is one of the major, major scratcher heads is you look at the marketing, general, and administration expenses, and they are $766,000 and some change. $766,000 and change. What type of advertising, what type of administration fees are you doing? Well, I can assume and we're assuming guys i'm not i don't know this to be true or anything like that but i would assume that you're paying yourself or individuals as administration fee and he's probably doing the marketing on top of that so he's making money and charging it to the fund on top of only bringing in three thousand dollars in rental income so by the time you get all the way to the end of this financial statement he has lost one million dollars and some change one million dollars and some change he has lost because the biggest expense on the entire financial statement is the $766,000 that he is charging for marketing, advertising, administrative fees, which it doesn't really break down what the administration fees are, but I would hope that if you were an investor, you could actually see what those fees were because that's the way it's normally supposed to be done. But also too, I would think you would want to know why are you only bringing in income of rental income if I'm investing in a real estate fund? Why are you only bringing in $3,000 of rental income for an entire year? That just doesn't make sense to me. But yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna give you some bonus stuff that I just saw in this SEC report is he didn't charge depreciation, which normally should go to each member of the fund so you can reap the benefits of of being in, you know, real estate also, but he didn't charge any depreciation on the Legacy Center. I don't know if he tr charged any depreciation on any of the other stuff, but it looks like the biggest thing he bought was the Legacy Center and he did not charge depreciation on that. I don't know why, because you would want, like I said, your members to share in the benefit of that tax write-off. But I actually kind of do know why, because if that was the case, he would have to actually do all of the paperwork that is associated with getting out the tax information to all of his investors. And you, once again, if you watch my video previously, it would take an army to do that and a lot of manpower. And if you don't have that, and if you have not hired a third party to do that for you, then you can't do it. So. My guess is he's probably going to, I'm assuming, I'm assuming that he's going to take depreciation himself or he's going to sell the property and then he won't have to add back the depreciation because he never took it. So he'll just take the profits. But at the end of the day, guys, it's just so much to unpack. I mean, I love, love looking at the numbers like this, but the truth of the matter is, is that when you look at this video, and I didn't mean to make this video this long, but when you look at a, a situation like this and you look at the details, it is written all day in this that everything he is doing is legal. He has just, once again, it's unethical. He has done it the legal way and you have to read through pages and pages and pages and pages of documents to read and see exactly what it is. And if you aren't a uh, an investor who actually knows about this type of stuff and you would just trust someone who's popular or you would just trust the person at their word and you didn't go to an attorney or some financial consultant, you would be lost with this and you wouldn't understand it and you would just hope that the person would speak plain English to you and kind of explain to you exactly what it was. But like I said before, there's a bunch of red flags when it comes to this. The $500 entry at 8%, I mean, what is that, 40 bucks? I mean, it's just an administrative of nightmare. No one would do that. And I just really feel for investors. And I hope that you guys are able to possibly get your money back. But based on what's in the document, it is legal. What he's doing is legal. And it's just unethical. If you signed on this dotted line and you sent them the money, it's going to be tough to get the money back based off of you didn't give me my dividend or I didn't make any money off of this. It's going to be really tough because they did their investigation and blah, blah, blah. And 
At the end of the day, they came back and said, yeah, everything's good. So it's just sad, but I just want you guys to really look at this video and go through all of the details that I said. I will put the link at the bottom of uh, in my description and you can just read it from top to bottom and it will explain everything to you guys and you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about. But once again, guys, if you got value out of this video, please hit that subscribe button, hit that notification button and that like button so that you will be able to see videos like this when I release them and I'll see you on the next one. Thanks.